He reigns today, tomorrow, and forever. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You may be seated. It is an exciting day to declare the praises of the Lord. And uh, I'm going to ask for all of our students, all of our kids, if you would come on up to the front here. And uh, even you teenagers that are here, if you wouldn't mind coming up. And, and don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel shy. But uh, today we want to take the time to pray for all of our students uh, that are going to be going back to school. Yeah, just fill the stairs here. Come on right on up. Come up another level if you want. There you go. Isn't this awesome? Yeah. Woo. All right, let me see. I, I, up, I look like a student. I'm about the right height. If I stand right here. Right, there we go. So if, if You're hiding in there. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, we want to have prayer for all these students. Many of them are going back to school. Some of them are starting junior high for the first time. Some of them are starting elementary school for the first time. And then there's those that are starting to speak in microphones for the first time. <laughs> Good kid. But uh, they're starting uh, preschool and different things like that. And, and it's just an awesome opportunity we have to pray for them. Did you start already? You're going to kindergarten. There's some that are going to kindergarten for the first time. And uh, it's awesome. And uh, so we want to have prayer for them this morning. And uh, how many of you remember when you started going back to school each year? Yeah, you can't remember that far back. Come on. How many of you remember wondering, am I going to make any friends? Did you know that that's the number one worry for kids? Is will I make any friends this year at school? And so... We want to pray that they make more friends than they've ever made in their life before. And that those friendships will be just a blessing that they're able to minister to them and just show the love of Jesus. But uh, the second worry for most kids going back to school is, will I do good on my grades? You know, and uh, so we're going to pray that God's favor will be with them, that they're going to do great in all of their classes. And then the third worry for all students, and honestly, this was my first worry, was will I have a teacher that's mean or nice? So with that, we're going to pray, and we're going to ask all of our teachers to come up this morning as well. So if you are a teacher, come on up. I, I know Miss Renee is not here. She's homesick, but uh, Katie and Miss Adrian, and uh, come on up. And Rhonda, she's not here this morning, but uh, we want to pray for our teachers that they will be the nice teachers. Amen. <laughs> And that God will bless their classrooms as well. And uh, so this morning, um, I'm going to ask for those of you that uh, may have uh, kids up here, or you're a grandparent of somebody that's up here this morning, uh, would you just come up as well and just stand in front, and uh, we're going to pray for them this morning. Hallelujah. Now, we're not going to lay hands on them forcefully or anything. We're just going to pray for them. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Amen. So this is what I want you to do, those of you that are parents and grandparents. Um, you may not know the name of some of these kids, but I'm going to ask you to pray for a child that's not yours. Pray for a child that's not yours this morning. Because they need that prayer. And this is what the family and the body of Christ is for. To lift one another up. And to believe that God's going to do great things. And then after you've prayed for that other child, even though you may not know their name, then you can pray for your own children. But uh, those of you that are out here this morning, would you just extend a hand and let's just begin to pray and believe that God's going to do great things in these kids' lives. Father, I thank you for every one of these students. Lord, from the youngest going into preschool, into kindergarten, for those that are starting first grade. Father, I pray for those that are going into junior high, sixth grade for the first time. Lord, those that may be entering into the high school for the very first time. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would give them friends this year. Give them great friends, friends that they never even would have thought would have been their friend. So Lord, I pray that you would bless them in that manner. Father, as they uh, study, as they learn, Lord, I pray that their comprehension, their retention of what they learn would just be amazing. 
Lord, that their teachers would be amazed, that their parents would be amazed, and they would do so great in all of their classes. Father, I pray, Lord God, for their teachers. Lord, I pray that their teachers would be the best teachers they ever had. And Lord, that this year as they go into those classrooms, they'll look forward to going to those classrooms. Father, I pray for our teachers this morning. Lord, I pray for Katie, for Adrian, I pray for Renee, I pray for Rhonda. Lord, for others that are teaching or others that are helpers in our school system. Father, I pray that you would be with them. Lord God, lead them, guide them. Father, your word says a gentle answer turns away wrath. So Father, I pray that you would give our teachers that ability, Lord God, just to speak peace and hope and love into their lives. Father, I pray, Lord, there are many in our church here that work in our school system outside of teaching, Lord. They, they help as a faculty in different manners. Lord, I pray you would bless them. Lord, I pray that as they walk on to their campuses, Lord, whether an elementary school, a junior high, a senior high, Lord, even Penn State Altoona, Lord, that you would just allow for them to be a light. And so, Father, I pray now you're covering over every one of these students. We pray, Lord, for every school that it would be protected by you, Lord God. And Lord, I pray for all students, Lord God, that they would recognize that you are the way, the truth, and that you are their hope. Lord, I thank you for these kids this morning. Lord, I pray your blessing upon them. Bless mom and dad. Give them the patience in the morning, Lord Jesus, (laughs) as they get the kids ready to go. Lord, help them to recognize that you have blessed them, that these kids are a blessing to them as a family. Lord, help them to be able to assist them in their schoolwork when necessary. And Lord, help us to understand that Common Core math is just stupid and crazy. But we will help them anyway. Lord, we just trust in you and we praise your name. And we give you the glory and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Give thanks. Oh, we lost the mic. (laughs) It's not on. Jim, is it on? Okay. Come on, it's Alex. I just want to tell you, everyone, how powerful the church is with these kids. This little guy here, last year even, he kept telling everyone about Jesus in school. This year already, he's there, he just throws his hand up on the sliding board and to his teacher and says, so, let me tell you about Jesus. <laughs> you know, I mean, already, what he's doing. And ever since he's been coming here, the growth in this family and just the things that, that he continues to do, the boldness, that he has, he has no fear. He, he, <laughs> he has this major crush on my daughter, Riley. And one, <clears throat> and one day someone said, why do you love Riley? And his words were, because she loves Jesus like I do. So. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God is faithful. Amen. And so as we go through another school year, don't let this today be the day that you pray for these students. Let every day be a day that you pray for the kids of our church, the families and the teachers, because we live in in trying times, but we know the one who sees us through those trials. Amen? And so we just trust in him. Amen. Kids, you are welcome to go over to class. Miss Kate, wherever she is, is going to be teaching today. So just go ahead on over to your classes. Preschool, you can go back with Miss Charlie and Miss Judy. And uh, thank you so much. It's because of uh, our teachers and our workers each and every week that uh, we're able to see God touch these hearts and lives. And uh, what a blessing it is. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask as uh, they're heading over to their class and as we get resituated, I'm going to ask our ushers if they would prepare to receive an offering again this morning. We want to respond to... uh, the disaster uh, that Dorian caused in the Bahamas. And I just want to update you briefly here, and we're going to show a video, but uh, Convoy of Hope delivered seven plane loads of relief supplies into Freeport, into Treasure K uh, this past Friday. In total, the planes carried approximately 3,000 pounds of clean water, tarps, ready-to-eat food, crisis care kits, diapers, wipes, formula, and generators. And sometimes we think when devastation hits, you know, we think about taking care of the needs of adults, and oftentimes we forget that many of them have children that are babies. And and this is one of the ways in which Convoy is so uh, 
passion and so able to touch lives is they went in with diapers and wipes and formula to help feed these babies. Um, 1,500 meals were provided uh, that first Friday, this past Friday alone. Um, as of right now, they have eight planes that are scheduled to go in every day for this next coming week uh, to bring relief supplies, and they are working on getting a, a container, uh, a ship to go in. The problem is right now they don't have any place to take the ship into, um, and so they're working those logistics out so they can get it in into a place uh, that uh, really needs the help. And so uh, we want to receive just an offering for that. And, and before we do, I want you to take and listen to... Uh, what uh, uh, one of the uh, directors of Convoy of Hope has to say. Go ahead and roll that video, Joe. Hey guys, Jeff Neeney with Convoy of Hope. Our response teams have been hard at work for the past week, preparing equipment and making plans on how to best respond. We have two teams in the Bahamas working on getting supplies to people as quickly as possible. We're coordinating airdrops as well as containers going in on ships. A response team deployed to the Carolinas in anticipation of any damage Dorian may cause as it makes its way up the coast. We have multiple tractor trailer loads of emergency food, water, and supplies already en route. We've connected directly with churches in the Bahamas to help with the distribution phase. Your partnership with Convoy of Hope puts you directly on the front lines of serving people in need. Thank you for your support. And that's true, they are hope in every storm. I'm going to ask our ushers if they would come at this time. If you uh, didn't come prepared to give, you can always go onto the church website, uh, newlifealtuna.org, and there's a link that you can uh, click on, and it's a giving link, and it'll just walk you through if you want to give, and you can just uh, designate it towards uh, the hurricane response or towards Dorian, and uh, it'll meet that need. It'll go directly there. You can also download the New Life uh, app on your phone, and you can give through that as well. But uh, this morning, we just want to lift these up, and uh, there's many. One of the pastors, one of the Assembly of God pastors in the Bahamas, um, uh, he had to swim to the very top of the rafters in his home uh, just to escape uh, from drowning. And uh, so the devastation has been great, but uh, we're trusting the Lord that through this, God's name would be lifted high, and many would be set free, and uh, that God would deliver in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We pray for the Bahamas right now. Lord, many have lost everything. Many have lost their loved ones through this tragedy as well. So Lord, they're struggling with just how to survive in the physical sense, let alone how to carry on with the loss of a loved one. And yet, Lord, you have raised up organizations like Convoy of Hope, Samaritan's Purse, the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, you've raised them up for such a time as this. To be there to comfort, to be there to meet physical needs. And Lord, you have raised the church up, especially for times like this. Lord, that we would look at the hurting of our brothers and sisters and we'd say, what can we do? What part can we do? We may not be able to go. We may not be able to ever physically touch. But Lord, we can help meet the needs financially. Lord, as we give in this offering, as we designate it to go to Convoy of Hope, we know that it will be used to touch hearts and lives and to restore hope in a hopeless situation. So, Father, as we give this morning, we thank you for this opportunity. And may your name be lifted high. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, as we receive the offering, we want to just sing a song, and this song just simply says, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sin and griefs to bear. Hallelujah. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What Everything to 
verse number two. Have we trials? Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble everywhere? Oh, we should never be discouraged. Oh, take it to James chapter 1, verse 13. Thank you, worship team, for your ministry this morning. If you have your Bibles, James chapter 1, verse 13 is our text this morning. It says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is own evil desire. He's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full-blown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change, but he chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all created. Father, I thank you for your work. Speak to our hearts this morning as this message is brought forth. Holy Spirit, I pray your anointing upon it. Anoint our ears to hear, our hearts to respond today. Lord, we just thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Temptation. That is what we're going to be looking at this morning. Where does temptation come from? The source of temptation. Temptation's source. What is it? Where does it come from? I found that some people fall into temptation, but for some reason I've also discovered that a lot of people actually make plans to fall into temptation. They make plans because, you know, they're thinking, well, there's no way that I'm going to be able to overcome it, so I'm just going to plan ahead for when I do fall into temptation. The story is told of a father and a son who were walking uh, out in the, 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 the valley one day, and they came across this canal, and the father looked and said, Son, I don't want you to ever swim in this canal. Okay, dad, said the son. A couple of nights later, the dad is sitting on the porch, and here comes his son walking, holding his bathing suit, and he's dripping wet, and the father looks, and he says, Son, where have you been? What, why are you all wet? And the son said, Well, I was swimming in the canal. Didn't I tell you you shouldn't swim in that canal? Yes, sir, said the boy. Well, why didn't you listen? Why did you disobey? Well, well dad... He explained, I had my bathing suit with me, and I just, I couldn't resist the temptation. Why did you take your bathing suit with you, said the father, so I'd be prepared to swim just in case I was tempted. How many of us live our life like that? I'm going to take this just in case I'm tempted, and then I can jump in with both feet. How many of you remember the uh, old TV show, Hee Haw? You remember that show? Yeah, my parents forced me to watch it too. Um, but uh, 
there was one segment of Hee Haw where um, Doc Campbell would be in his office and he'd have clients that would come in. And in this one episode, a, a guy comes in. He says, he says Doc, uh, the doc says, what's the problem? He says, Doc, I, I broke my arm in two places. And the doc's response was, avoid those two places. Wise wisdom from a guy on Hee Haw. <laughs> but wise wisdom nonetheless. Avoid those places that are going to cause temptation. Avoid those places that are going to lure you in. But the question is, what are those places? Where does temptation come from? Where does it come from? Sometimes the desire and craving for things on earth can almost seem unbearable. We see something and we know that it's wrong, but we, we say, oh, I, I know I shouldn't do that, but I, I just have to have it right. I just need to do it. Why? Because the desire and the craving become so strong that we, we can't push ourselves away from it. I read a story in Reader's Digest of a man who was out shopping with his wife at a mall kiosk, and while shopping, a, a shapely young woman in a short, form-fitting dress strolled by, and he, he said, I, I didn't move my head at all, but my eyes just kind of followed her. Without even looking up, my wife said, I hope that was worth the trouble you're in, mister. <laughs> Where does temptation come from? <laughs> it comes in all shapes and forms and all different wiles of the enemy. Look again, if you would, at James chapter 1. Let me read it one more time this morning, verses 13 through 18. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits for all he created. This is what temptation is. Temptation is the desire and craving for selfish things. Temptation is the desire and craving for things that are wrong, for things that, that God forbids in his word, things that God says, oh, you shouldn't have that. You don't need that in your life. Temptation comes in forms that, uh, of things that are bad for our physical bodies, our emotional bodies, even our spiritual bodies. Temptation will come, and temptation comes to lure us away from being the person God desires us to be. See, no matter what it is, even if man justifies it, even if man says, oh, that's acceptable in today's day and age. If God's word says it's sin, then it is still wrong because it's going to bring harm to our bodies. It's going to bring harm to our lives. It's going to bring harm to our families. It's going to bring harm to our spirit. It's going to bring harm to those around us. You see, when we feel an urge or a craving for such things, the Bible says that that is what is happening. We are being tempted to do evil. When you have that craving, when you feel that urge to, to go ahead and do something, you're kind of like, ah, I'm not sure about that. I, I don't think it's right. I probably shouldn't do it. The Bible says that, that we are being tempted to do evil. But he also says that we are to flee the temptation. We're to flee the temptation, not entertain it, not look at it and say, well, let me just weigh the consequences here a little bit. No, it says flee from that temptation. Where does temptation come from? Why do we desire and crave things that are so bad and so wrong for us? I was doing really good. I'll be honest. I was doing really good. I started back watching what I was eating, started exercising again, and I was doing really good until last night. I went over to my daughter's house, and, and they made us uh, smoked wings. And man, the wings were amazing, and, and that was part of what I could eat and part of what I was thinking. And, and, and we were just about getting ready to go. It was almost halftime of the game, and I said, Suzanne, we're going to leave. And, and Carly goes, uh, I have ice cream in the fridge. Or the freezer. I'm like, oh, why did you do that? And I could have said, no, I'm not going to have any. But for some reason, it was chocolate mocha fudge swirl. and It was just of God. Oh, wait, wait. See how we do that? See how temptation can twist our thinking? Oh, what's... One scoop gonna hurt. Yeah, right. How many of you have ever just done one scoop? 
you know, it, it cracks me up. They have these, these single serve packets so you can control your portion intake. Yeah, okay. One serving, one portion. I don't know why they do it, because I'll eat two or three anyway. Why? Because that temptation, that lure is there. It just pulls us in. Where does it come from? What causes that urge? Well, in order to understand it and be able to overcome it, I think we need to know its origin. First of all, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we need to recognize that temptation is not of God. Temptation does not come from God. Man has always been in the blaming game. Man has always blamed somebody else for the temptations that lead them to sin. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, God found Adam in the, in the garden, and he said, Adam, Adam, dude, Adam, I, what happened here? If you look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12, this is Adam's response. The woman you gave me made me do it. The woman you gave me made me do it. So God looks at Adam and goes, okay. And he moves on to Eve. Eve, Adam just told me that it was your fault. Eve, why? Why did you do it? And what does Eve do? The serpent caused me to eat of it. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. But in reality, they were all, they were both blaming God. Because when you go back to it, Adam goes, God, this woman you gave me. Wasn't necessarily just blaming the woman, he was blaming God. You see, the point is that man seldom takes responsibility for his own wrongdoing. How many times have we said, but, but I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for so-and-so, or they made me do it, or this was the cause of it. Husbands blame wives, wives blame their husbands, children blame the parents, parents blame the kids, students blame the teacher, the teacher blames the school, business partner blames business partner, employer blames employee, employee blames employer, everybody's blaming, 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 blaming. Nobody's taking responsibility for their own willful desire to give in to temptation. And so we find ourselves constantly trying to justify our behavior, uh, trying to, to calm, trying to ease our conscience in a sense. And we do that by blaming other people. But the bottom line is when we blame others, we're really blaming God. How do we do that? By wondering why God ever let such a thing happen to us. Think about that. We blame God. God, why did you let this happen to me? And he's like, wait, wait a second here. I didn't force you to do that. It was a temptation that came from an urge, from a desire, and, and, and you didn't have to give in to that, but yet we blame him nonetheless. God, why did you, God, oh, why did, I, why did you let me marry that person? I've heard that before. God, why, why did you let this happen? Why did you let that happen? God, why did you give me this horrible job, these people that I have to work with every day? God, why did you do that? And we blame God for so many things that aren't, God's faults. We blame God by thinking that he created us with desires and passions, and, and if, he, if we give in to those desires and passions, then it must be okay, that there must be nothing wrong with that. Oh, God will understand. God will just forgive me for that. We blame him and say that he made the world as it is, everything in it, therefore he'll understand. He'll forgive me. But church, God is not the one who arouses those lustful desires, those cravings within us. Look again at verse number 13 of James chapter 1. It says, no one should say, no one should think, no one should rationalize, no one should justify, no one should say, oh, it's okay, because no one should say when he is tempted that God is tempting me. So we have to understand, first and foremost, that temptation does not come from God. God himself is never tempted. God can't be tempted with evil. God is holy. God is righteous. God is pure. And there is nothing within him that would cause him to ever desire to tempt you or even be tempted. You see, by his very nature, God can have absolutely nothing to do with evil. God can have nothing to do with temptation. To tempt a person is an evil thing to do. God's not like that. God's like, oh, I'm going to tempt them just a little bit more and see how they respond. No, 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 that's not God doing that. No, God is a good God. God is the opposite of temptation. God's holiness doesn't allow him to be tempted to do evil. 
can't be tempted to tempt man, can't tempt us to do awful things, can't tempt us to do unholy things. God doesn't t- attempt, God does not tempt any person. Nobody, none of, nobody in this room does God look down and say, I'm going to get them today. On the contrary, God loves, cares, and seeks to save man. Not damage us. God seeks to save us. God seeks to to bring hope and health and healing. God seeks to set us free from the bondage of sin. God is not set to destroy. God is set to set us free. When a person is tempted to do a forbidden thing, when uh, to do something harmful, the urge and craving is not from God. I want you to understand that that urge, that craving, it's not from God. God wants the person to turn away. The Bible says to flee from temptation. Don't crumble. Don't succumb and say, oh, I just couldn't do it. Don't be like that boy. I take your bathing suit just in case you wanted to jump in. Just in case you were tempted. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee the desires, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Flee the evil desires of you. Flee those things that you would just give in to. Flee those, those, those attractions that, oh, that looked pretty good, and I'll just give in to it today, or I'll, I may do that tomorrow. Flee those things, it says. If you turn over to James chapter 4, look at what verses 1 through 3 say. What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? You want what you don't have, So you scheme and kill to get it. Let me stop there. You want what you don't have. Isn't that just the way everything seems to be in life? I want that, but man, I don't have it. I want that, and they have it. God, how could you give them that and not me that? God, I... I, See how our mind and see how the enemy will just sneak in 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 simple ways and ways that cause us to look and say, ooh, I want what they have. I want what they have. The enemy works in that way. It says you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. I have met many a scheming people <laughs> to try and just get what they want. It says you are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Think about the bully in the schoolroom. <laughs> You've got something that they don't have, and they're going to wage and fight, and they're going to make war just to get what you have. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You see, instead of trying to take it, instead of going after the things of this world, the Bible says we need to ask the Lord because he's the one that provides. And then it says even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You look and say, oh, look what they've got. They've got everything perfect. Look at their family. God, their family. So God, I want that family. This family, it's, it's not right. It's not good. So I'm going to go and I'm going to try and get a family just like that one. Oh, God, look, at, look what they have. Look at their house. My, my house isn't good enough. God, I want a house just like them. And I, I'm going to scheme. I'm going to plot to get it that way. But our motives are wrong. Our motives are wrong because we're selfishly saying, I need this. I want this. Number two, temptation is caused by man's own lust. Where does temptation come from? It comes from our own lust. There are three significant steps involved in temptation and sin. Three steps that we need to understand if we are to consistently conquer temptation in our lives. The first one is this, is that, that, that there is lust and enticement. Lust and enticement. Enticement is always out there, always saying, hey, you need to have this, you need to have that. There are things in this world that will always entice you. No matter how old you get, there will be things that are always enticing to you. Chocolate ice cream, mocha swirl, the fudge, enticing. That relationship, enticing. That job, enticing. What they have, enticing. Every man and woman without exception is tempted, the Bible says, when they are drawn away by his own lust and enticed. That's where it comes from. The word lust means to crave either good or evil. 
to lust after something. It could be good or evil. Because there are good desires and there are bad desires. Good desires to love your spouse and your kids. Good desires to read the Bible and to pray. Good desires to attend church every week. Good desires to eat healthy. There are good desires that are within inside of us. We have those good desires and, and those are lusts. We want to do what's right. We, we want to do exactly as, as God's word says. We want to be a loving husband, a loving father, a loving spouse. We, we want to be a good employee or a good employer. We have those good desires. But this passage is talking about those bad desires. The word entice means to lure or to bait. Just, just like a person that would, would put a, a worm on the end of a hook to catch a fish. We're enticed. We're lured away. We all have natural and normal desires. So when we begin to think about or look at something, we naturally desire it. So we see that and we're like, naturally, oh yeah, that looks good. Our desire is a normal behavior. But the problem arises when the thing that we are looking at, that natural desire, is something that is forbidden by God. Something that is forbidden because of who we are in Christ, something that's forbidden because now we are, are married, we're no longer single, and so you better not be looking at that other man or that other woman. It's forbidden. But yet, we have a desire, we notice things, we see things, and yet it says it's when we are pulled away by them. If we look at it and think about that forbidden thing, we're enticed, we begin to lust, and we begin to get lured in by it. It's the beginning of the stage of temptation. When we take our desire and our focus and we put it upon, upon the forbidden thing, when we put it on that harmful thing, Eve was in the garden just enjoying the beauty that God created and she's just going along and man, these trees are awesome. Look at all this fruit. Look at this vegetation. Man, God, this is awesome. And all of a sudden she hears, hey, Eve, come here, Eve. Who is it? And there's the serpent in the tree. Eve, look at this tree. Isn't this tree amazing? Isn't it beautiful? Look at the fruit on this tree. Now Eve is going through the garden. She's looking at everything else, and it's perfect. It's just as God said. And God says, Eve, you can't eat from that tree because it'll bring death. Oh, but the devil comes along. Oh, don't believe him. Look, it's so beautiful. And Eve, instead of saying, pfft, Hey, dumb serpent, I'm not listening to you. I'm listening to God. She begins to look at the tree. Oh, yeah, the, the, that is pretty nice. Oh, yeah, that fruit that does seem a little br brighter, a little bit more, more in, enjoyable to eat. Think about it when you, if you ever go to a fruit farm, if you just go to an apple orchard and you look at the apples and you pick an apple off the tree, you look at it, it goes, there's some spots, there's some rough edges, it's not really shiny, but when you go to a store, and you pick up an apple, you look at it and go, wow, that's a shiny apple. You know why? It's because they spray them with wax to shine them, to make them look better. You see, it's a counterfeit. It's just to make things look better. And the devil will do that. He will entice you to pull you away. Say, doesn't this look better than all that God has? She was enticed. She was pulled away. Secondly, there's the conception of lust, and then it gives birth to sin. Lust gives birth to sin. The person actually begins to look at it and think about the forbidden thing. Desire and lust are conceived within the mind. Oh, yeah, that looks good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after Oh, yeah, I can't live without that. And they begin to conceive it. They begin to think about it. They begin to dwell on it over and over and over. And they think, yeah, oh, man, I'm going to eat that. Or I'm going to go after this. I'm going to go after that. They begin to picture the pleasure of the desire. This is when sin is actually born. Sin isn't actually born when you commit the sin. Sin is actually born when you begin to think about the pleasure that committing the sin will bring. When you picture looking at it or thinking about that desire. Because this is what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He said, I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her. A person that even looks at a person, if you even look and desire and say, ooh, man, this is going to be great. This is going to be wonderful. Wouldn't that be amazing if this just happens? It says you've already committed that sin within your heart. I want you to understand this this morning. Temptation doesn't start with a crazy, far-off scheme of the devil. Ooh, I'm going to lure them in secretly. No, temptation begins with the normal, natural desires of man and our thoughts. But instead of fleeing... Instead of 
putting them to death instead of getting rid of them, instead of doing what the Bible says, get rid of all unwholesome thought, unwholesome talk, get rid of all those things and put good things in, we allow our mind to conceive them. What would it be like if I had this or had that? What would it be like with this person or that person? What would it be like if I just did this or that? We picture the pleasure and it begins that desire of lust. And at the moment we begin to lust after it, the Bible says that sin is born. The wrong is committed right there in the mind. And when it's committed in the mind, the heart is set up to fall because of the forbidden thing. Oh, now we may never act upon it. We may never do it. But man, if we had the chance or if we had the courage, we might just do it. Why? Because we've pictured it. We've processed it so much in our mind. What would it be like? The Bible says you've committed sin in your heart already. Number three, there is the result of lust and enticement. The Bible says it's death. It leads to death. Man dies physically, spiritually, and eternally because of sin. You see, when God created man, he didn't create man to die. He didn't create Adam and Eve and say, okay, I'm going to put you on the planet and planet earth and, and, and uh, you're going to have, oh, 60 years to live your life. No, God created Adam and Eve to live forever, to be in fellowship with him, to, to, to have communication and relationship with God forever. But the enemy came along and deceived Eve. And the Bible says that when sin entered the world, so also did death. You see, when we sin, when we conceive, death comes into our life. Think about how guilty you feel when you do something you know is wrong. It's almost like somebody stabs you, like, oh, why did I do that? Oh, I shouldn't have done that. If you don't feel that way, man, you, I don't know what's wrong, because I feel that way when I do something wrong. Man, why did I do, oh, it's, God. And we feel guilty, and we, it's almost like death comes upon us. We can almost sense that in our lives. And then we try and think, man, what do I got to do? How do I fix this? What do I have to do? How, many, how, many, how do I make this right? But it's not about making it right. It's about saying, okay, God, forgive me. Help me never to do it again. And then to walk in the ways of righteousness. You see, when God created man, he didn't create him to die. But man chose to die. Man chose to die because he chose to sin. He chose to sin. I'm going to choose this forbidden fruit over everything else that God has. See, that's the way of the world. Choosing the forbidden things that bring death rather than those which bring life. Finally, number three, temptation is not a part of God's nature. Look at verses 17 and 18 again. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift is from above. It comes from God. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who doesn't change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Jesus is the word of truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He gave us the word. His name is Jesus. His desire is that we have a relationship with him. He gave us the truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. A kind of first fruits that all created. When you go back to the, the garden, God created all the fruits in the garden. But he's saying, man, I want you to be the first fruit. I want you to be the, 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 the prized possession. I want to bless you in such a way that you recognize it's from me. You see, church, God is a good and perfect God. God is a good and perfect God. He's not, he's not God if he's not perfect. He's not God if he's not good. He's not God if he doesn't desire the best for his creation. He's not God if he desires anything other than to meet your needs, to bless you, to provide for you. You see, being good and perfect, God can have absolutely nothing to do with temptation and sin. Because of this, he's not the one who tempts man. Verse 17 says, God is the one who gives man every good gift that we receive. I love that the next part says, God is the father of lights, and he is unchangeable. God is the father of lights, and he is the God that created the heavens and earth, the God that created Adam and Eve, is the same God that created you today. 
He's the same God that's created all things. He's a perfect God. He's a good God. You see, it's temptation that leads us into a world of darkness. It's temptation that leads us into sin. It's not God that leads you into sin. God is the the father of lights, the creator of the sun, the moon, the stars. God is the creator of light itself. When you think about it, every day, what we see of the sun, what we see of the moon, what we see of the stars, every day it changes in our eyes. It changes because the, the, the earth is rotating around the sun and the moon moving here and the moon moving there. And so every day things are changing in those aspects. So when we look, we see that things are changing Because the sun is setting over the horizon, or the the moon is coming up at night, or the stars begin to shine brighter. And we see those changes taking place. But the Bible says this, with God there is not even a shadow of change. God is consistent. He never changes. When we look at God, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, we can look at the, the moon. Suzanne and I sat out on the back steps last night just looking at the moon and the stars, just looking up at it. And I can tell you this, if we were to do that again tonight, it's going to be totally different. Because our perspective of it changes, and, and, and it's going to be in a different location in the sky this evening. But with God, he never changes. He is always the same. He is consistent. He's unchangeable. It's temptation that leads us away. God's the father of lights, the creator of everything. All these other things can change, but God's light is perfect. God's light is perfect, so perfect that there isn't even a variation. There's not even a shadow of turning with God. Not a shadow of turning. He's unchangeable. He gives us, the Bible says, good gifts. Not bad gifts. And the greatest gift he gives us is the gift of eternal life. You see, God's will, God's ultimate plan, God's desire for every man, woman, child, from the youngest to the oldest, for every human being that has breath on earth, God's desire is that they would be born again, that they would have new life in Jesus Christ. This is what it says in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord's will is that that rotten, miserable, horrible neighbor of yours would come to repentance in Jesus Christ. The Lord's will is that you, that rotten, horrible, miserable neighbor that you are, (laughs) would come to repentance. God's will and desire is that person that is locked behind bars because they committed a murder, because they committed a heinous crime. God's will, God's desire is not that they suffer in hell, that they suffer damnation and punishment for eternity in hell, but God's desire, even for the most vile person in the world, God's desire is that they would come to a relationship of repentance through Jesus Christ. You see, it's hard for us to picture that. It's hard for us to say, how could God do that? Because God is not a God of evil. God is not a God that brings temptation. God is a God of love. God is a God of perfect peace and hope. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, to dispel the darkness. We say it. Some of you have probably said it. Oh, but for the grace of God, there go I. (laughs) If it wasn't for God's grace, man, I'd be that person behind the bars. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I don't even know if I'd be here today. You see, God is a God of love. God is a God of compassion. God is a God that reaches down into our darkest place and says, hey, my hope for you is that you have a relationship with my son. Because when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, he's going to bring you out of the darkness. He's going to shine the light of hope into your life. God wants you to know the word of truth. If we ever hear the word of error, it's not of God. When you hear the things of this world being thrown around, this is right, that's right, this is right, that, man, you should know in your heart, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, well, that's not what God's word says. But so many people give ear to things in this world. Why? Because the Bible says they're ear. They give ear to itching things because they desire to hear it. They want it to be in their life. All humanistic and false teachings about truth are not of God. Some other source. Some source that is out to tempt man, to pull him away from God, to pull him away from his truth. So church, we need to realize the tragic consequences of temptation. We need to understand that we can't blame God when things go wrong. We can't blame God. God, why was I unable to stay away from that? God, why did you let me do that? God, it's your fault. 
No, we are lured away. We are enticed by our own desires. We need to realize that we have to accept responsibility. And when we accept the responsibility, the good news is that God will deliver you. God will deliver you. When you accept the responsibility, say, man, I messed up. I, I realized that. I was tempted. I was lured away, and I, I gave into this. I gave into that, and I, I realized I shouldn't have. God says, hey, I am here now, and I will deliver you from that. Turn over to 1 Corinthians. Let me close with this verse. 1 Corinthians. This is kind of going to lead into next Sunday morning, Lord willing. Temptation comes. Temptation bombards us. So how do we, how do we overcome it? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. No temptation has overcome you except what is common to mankind. Last week I talked about there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> the same temptation that tempted Eve is tempting us today. The same temptation that was in the days of Noah is the same temptation that's happening today. The same temptation as the children of Israel were out in the desert, the, the temptation to grumble and complain and blame God, that temptation is still there in our hearts and our minds today. Nothing new. There's no temptation new that isn't common to mankind. But God is faithful. There is no temptation that has overtaken you, that is not common to mankind. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Some people misquote that scripture so much. <laughs> well, God's not going to tempt me beyond what I can bear. God's not going to put me in that situation. And they think it's God doing it. It's not God doing it. It says God will not allow for you to be in that situation. Temptation is still going to come. Temptation is always going to be a part of your life. Until you take that final breath, you will be tempted by something. Even in the hospital bed, even as you're taking your last breath, you're going to be tempted by something. Because temptation is a part of the way the enemy tries to distract, or tries to pull us away from God. But God's faithful. He says, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted... He'll provide a way out so that you can endure it. He'll provide a way out so that when the temptation is there, you can endure it. In other words, you can overcome it, that you won't have to give in to it. Going back to the story about the boy at the, that, that I shared at the beginning, that said, don't jump into, into that water. Don't stay away from there. But the boy's like, oh, but what if I get out there and it's a hot day and, and that, oh, that water just looks so inviting you know, I, I might be tempted and, and I might just do it, so I better be prepared. I better pre -pre be prepared to, to jump in. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take my swimsuit with me every time I go and every time I'm passing that, just in case. And we find that that's how so many people live their lives, just in case the temptation comes. Instead of saying, Dad said no. And so... I'm going to avoid going by there so I'm not tempted. Dad said no, so I'm not even going to take my swimsuit. I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to go there when the, my friends are going there. You see, God says that when temptation comes, he'll provide a way for you not to give in to it. He'll provide a way for you to be able to stay strong and say no to that temptation. God will give you the ability. God will provide a way out so that you can endure it. Temptation attacks our thoughts, so we have to put those thoughts out of our mind. We need to push those thoughts out of our mind and begin to immediately focus on the thoughts of God. The world says, ooh, this looks good. This is enticing. Oh, yeah, go for it, go for it. God says, I'm going to give you a way out. Here's the way out. Lord, your word is faithful and true. Lord, you said I should think on things above rather than things below. Lord, you said in your word that you are faithful to see me through. Lord, the psalmist David, he said, he said Lord, uh, I, I failed, I've messed up, but Lord, I'm coming back to you. So Lord, help me to be strong. Help me to overcome. Help me to endure. 
You see, if temptation comes from some attraction to our senses, whether it be seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, then we need to turn our head away and flee that temptation. And when we flee that temptation, immediately we must put our focus upon Jesus Christ and begin to pray, begin to recall to our mind scriptures, memory verses, the promises of God's words. Because God will always provide a way for us to escape the temptation that we face. We can't blame God for what we do, and yet we do. We do blame God. Oh, God, why did you let this happen? James is saying the more satisfied we become in the God from whom all blessings flow, the less attractive evil will become. The more satisfied we become in God from whom all blessings flow, we become unsatisfied with him and what he has for us. We become satisfied with what direction he's leading our lives. The more we become satisfied with him, the more we become satisfied with the promises of his words, then the less attractive the evil things, the less attractive the lure, the enticement of the world will be. You see, sin's always going to be there, but its influence will fade in the brilliance, in the glory, in the light of Jesus Christ. The bigger God is in your life, the brighter, the more glorious he appears in your mind, the less and less attractive sin will become. And its ability to deceive you will grow smaller and smaller as you continually draw near to him. So the source of temptation comes from within. And sin must be dealt with on the inside. We deal with sin on the inside. We can't deal with sin on the outside. When you sin, it's not, okay, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to make up for the sin I committed. You know what? The sin's been committed. The, the, the death has already come. The Bible says when sin is committed, it brings about death. And because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We, we have no hope in fixing our sin problem. You can't fix the problem of giving in to that, that, that temptation by saying, well, I'm going to do this to try and make it better, to look better. See, the Bible says there's only one that can fix the problem of the sin in your life, and his name is Jesus. And he died on a cross for your sin. He died to forgive you of your sin. And he says, if you just turn to me, if you look to me, look to the work on the cross, he said, I'll lift you up. Not only will I lift you up, I'll, I'll set you on the right path. And when I set you on the right path, you're going to struggle. Yeah, you're going to have times of temptation, but you can always turn to me. You can always turn to the light. When you turn to the light, it'll direct your steps. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say, thanks be to God who gives me the victory because of my awesome, amazing wife. Oh, they might be there to help us. Then say, thanks be to God who gives me the victory because the Steelers are going to win tonight. And I won't be miserable at work tomorrow because they won. Think about how we rationalize. Think about what we use to say, I'm going to have victory because of this or because of that. It says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. If you're looking for hope, if you're looking for victory, if you're looking to be an overcomer this morning, it only comes through Jesus. It only comes through him. Temptation's going to come. But what will you do with that lure and enticement? Will you entertain it? Will you think about it? Will you fantasize about it? Or will you say, no, I'm crucifying it. I'm putting it to death right here and right now. And I'm going to let the light of Jesus Christ shine. Would you bow your heads this morning? Worship team, would you come on up? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hmm. Some of you this morning came in here and you're thinking about something and you realize, I probably shouldn't be thinking about that. The lore, the enticement of the things of this world, they, they are so strong and the enemy means him to be strong because he would like nothing more than to destroy your life. For he has come to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has come that you might have life and have it to the fullness. 
So this morning, we have to make that choice. Am I going to choose death or choose life? Am I going to choose the the things of this world, the enticements, the lure of this world that in the end is only going to bring hurt, heartache, pain, and ultimately death? Or will I choose to reject that temptation? Will I choose to put that temptation away and follow after the, the way of the Father, which is hope through His Son, Jesus Christ? You see, this morning... The Spirit of God is the one that is looking at the hearts. Man's not the judge. God's the judge. So where are you in your heart this morning? Where is your mind today? Is your mind thinking on things above or things below? Are you plotting and scheming? Some of you, I I don't know, you may have come in here plotting and scheming on how you could get out of a situation or get into a situation and man, the Holy Spirit's just hitting you this morning saying, nah, that's the way of the world. I'm giving you a way out today. I'm giving you hope so that you don't go that way. You see, every one of us, every one of us are tempted. Every one of us are being pulled. And the devil would like nothing more than for you to be a distraction, to, for you to be one that slips and falls, and for you to be one that somebody looks at and says, see, what's the point of being a Christian if they can't do it? But that's why we're all here, because we've all messed up. We've all fallen short of his glory, and God says, hey, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. Come back. Come on, come back. My grace is here for you. Friends, if we don't preach a gospel of grace, if we don't believe in the, the gospel of grace, then it's all worthless. Because we're going to mess up. We're going to fail. But it doesn't mean we just keep on going and sinning. It doesn't mean we just keep on falling and, and, and saying, well, God knows, and God, God allowed this to happen, and God will forgive me. No, no, it's not about that. It's about saying, God, I recognize my mistake, and I desire now to live a life that is right life that is holy and pure before you. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me today, Lord Jesus. Do you know him as your Savior today? Have you accepted him? Do you believe that he died on the cross for you? See, if you do, that's the greatest thing you could ever do and choose in your life. But if not, I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Before we leave, be, before we even sing another song, I want to give you that opportunity. Man, you've been fighting, you've been battling temptation, you've fallen and you succumb to so many different things that you're wondering, huh, is there any hope? But yes, there's hope today. And his name is Jesus. So if that's you with heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, you say, Pastor, would you just pray with me this morning that that today I would believe, today that I would receive that hope, that today I would ask Jesus to come into my life to forgive me of my sins. If that's you this morning, wherever you're at, front, back, right, left, would you just slip up your hand? I want to I pray for you this morning. Yes, here in the back, here in the front. Yes, here in the front. Anybody else? Jesus, come into my life. Today I want to give my life to you. Yes, over here in the back. Hallelujah. Today, Lord, come in, forgive me of my sins. I can't beat this temptation on my own, but Lord, I need you to help me. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you've given your life to the Lord already, but man, you've been struggling lately. (laughs) You've been struggling. You've been trying to fight off the temptation in your own strength, and this morning you realize, man, I need God's help. I need God's Holy Spirit. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life to to help me, to convict me, to convince me, and to, to move me away from that. How many of us this morning say, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I'm battling something right now, and I just need to stand strong in my faith. I need to stand strong in the power of who Christ is in me. I need that in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Lord, this morning I pray for these that raised their hand. <laughs> Lord, today is the greatest day the greatest day of their life because they're saying, Lord, I need you. I recognize I can't do this. I'm, I need you, Lord, to forgive me. I've been trying on my own. And it's led to nothing but misery, misery and pain. It's led to regret. It's led to failure. And so today, Lord, I'm, I'm giving it to you because I want hope. I want life. So just in your heart right now, just, just in your own way, would you say, Lord, forgive me of my sin? Oh, you don't have to name all your sins. Just say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for me to give me life. And today I choose that life. I choose to follow you. Help me to walk in victory each and every day. Because God has given us his son, Jesus Christ who is our victory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the victory today. Thank you for touching these lives. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Lord, your word says a new name has been written down in glory. <laughs> There's a new name in the Lamb's book of life. Lord, we praise you and we glorify Can we stand this morning? We're just going to sing this, this song. It's another wonderful hymn of the church. And it goes right along with what we've been talking about this morning. Because there are some times when we're tempted and we're like, I'm just going to go a little bit. But you know when you go a little bit, you go all the way. I could have had one scoop of ice cream last night, but I had three or four. <laughs> so this song just simply says, Lord, I will not be moved. When temptation comes, I will not.